Hello everyone, I'm Chris Beer. I'm uh, leading the service delivery panel. Um, I was kindly tapped by Pia and oh, hard enough that it, I said yes. Um, just looking for our... Yes, I know. Do, 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 main page. No, I'm in the wrong area. Next company. Because this makes it easy to see who's on our program. Because we're incredibly organised. All right. Uh, service delivery panel and government. Oh, we're back to there. Can we just call them up, though? Yeah, so um, I believe I'm first, anyway. Oh, James is first. So first we have James Purser, who um, by want of introduction, uh, Government 2.0, engagement, and particularly that oft forgotten about uh, sector of government, local government. Uh, we have uh, Tom Worthington, a new lecturer in all things IT and communications based records and records management. Um, we have myself, I'm from uh, Federal Government, Department of uh, Regional Australia, Local Government, Arts and Sports. And did we end up with a fourth person? We did end up with a fourth person, yes. And Darren, right, who I haven't met yet, who is from think Place. thinkplace.com.au. Actually, let's get that up, why not, because we can. I'm actually going to let Tom lead off, simply because he's the most organised, and he's ready to go right now. So there you go, all space barred up. Okay, now how long have I got? Five minutes. Five minutes, that's luxury. And I shall tie you and then poke you if you go over to the Okay, now if you, um, I'm uh, Tom Worthington, I'm a computer professional for hire and an adjunct lecturer here in the Australian National University Research School of Computer Science and dabble in the environment area as well. You might have noticed as Pia spoke I kept leaping up and down sitting over there because I said I've got a slide on that, I've got a slide on that. So um, what I wanted to suggest was um, as a university lecturer it might surprise you that I suggest we can use education to help with open government, open access to materials, and that tricky question of how to provide reliable, credible information from government and to government. So I used to be a public servant. I used to write government IT policy on the internet and web publishing and electronic records management. And I found it very frustrating. We'd write the policy, we'd get it approved, and nothing would happen. What I've discovered now as a uh, university lecturer is public servants enrol in the course, they effectively pay me money, and then I brainwash them as to what to do by teaching them about what to do, and by getting them to actually do it and practice it and get marked on it and so on, then it is something they learn to do as a matter of routine and then they actually do it. What are we talking about? Declaration of Open Government got a mention there from 2010 from Lindsay Tanner. Um, this followed uh, various discussions and inquiries and so forth, uh, basically saying the Australian government was going to make things more open. And a lot of us just went, oh yeah, that'll never happen. Um, but what happened was uh, FOI legislation was changed. We got a uh, office of the Australian Information Commissioner, is that what he's called? And the F and with some extra commissioners, uh, the FOI Commissioner is actually an adjunct lecturer here at the ANU as well. Um, and they did a survey in 2012 and looked to see whether the public service agencies were actually doing some of the things they were now supposed to do. And they thought it wasn't too bad, at least they were playing lip service to it. But they then suggested some problems with outdated re agency record keeping systems, differing information management practices, uh, lack of resources, 
problems with reforming and reformatting old documents. Sounds familiar, and I believe there's more information coming out from the Commissioner soon. But that's really saying we're checking up on you, but then you've got to get in the nitty gritty of how to do this. One way I think we can do it now is with cloud computing. Here's a slide from a talk I gave at a cloud computing records management conference. Um, um, if we go from lots of little computers in agencies storing records to more coordinated, larger scale things, there's the opportunity for doing things in a different way as a matter of course as part of the change. And I think we can do that as long as it's done properly. Uh, and we don't end up with our cloud computing records stored in some other country, for example, which would not be a good thing. Um, there is an Australian government um, policy on open access and use of Creative Commons, and that is being used. But I think we still have to, as a matter of nitty gritty, point out to public servants that this is now okay, this is now expected, this is now what you should be doing, what it means. When we're doing the websites for government agencies originally, to write the copyright notice for the Defence Department website, I copied it out of the front of a book and added to the copyright thing saying, but you're allowed to access it on the internet. Now we've got more routine procedures for that, but we just need to tell people about it. One way is PEER helps organise these GovHack, GovCamp things to get people together and excite them. Which, and also for the senior executives to see this stuff is okay and something they should do. At the formal end of that, what I do is uh, online open content e-learning for public servants and people who work for companies who work for the government. And so we say to them, you can have a university course, which is fully accredited and all that. Um, the content's in an e-book which you can download for free and read and do what you like with. Um, you have to attend online forums and discuss things with your fellow students and you'll be assessed on that. You have to write reports which can be workplace official government documents which you write in the workplace and then submit for marks. And your tutor will give you feedback on all of that. That's now done at universities, including the ANU, works fine. And hopefully we can do that more in the public service as well. And it sort of gets people working with people in different agencies and people in companies and discussing things and working out what they're allowed to say and not allowed to say and what tools they can use. And we do all that with uh, Moodle and other open source software type things. Um, you can get this presentation online and see some materials. And that's it, I'm out of time. Thank you very much. And hopefully Pierre will put a, like, a link to that from her wiki. Cool. All right. Who's next? Thank you, Tom. Um, next we have uh, Darren Menarkinson. He's from Think Place, uh, talking on design thinking and uh, their involvement in a federal government project. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> I was reflecting on design thinking last night and how I condensed that whole idea into a five-minute presentation. And that reflection led me to remembering a conversation that I had in about 2009 at an all-night um, an all-night uh, toaster cheese stand in the Nevada desert. And um, this is true. And sitting next to me, by sheer coincidence, was a doctor from Medicine Sans Frontiers. She'd just come from a, a sub-Saharan African country, which had spent a couple of years. And she'd had enough. She was going home to Germany. And uh, we got to talking, and I said, why is it? What, what's, what's the problem that you've been facing that's taking you out of it? She said, well, it's not about the medicine, because there's kind of enough there. It's not about the facilities, they're, they're not great, but they're okay. Um, but there's a couple of really big endemic problems. And they're exemplified by a story she told me. Um, so there is a, um, a pregnant woman, about seven months pregnant. She starts to feel a pain in her belly. She hitchhikes for about a day and a half to the local hospital. And she sits there for a couple of hours and then she sees a nurse. And the nurse asks her a couple of questions. She gives certain information that's going to be helpful in diagnosis. It's written down on a piece of paper and a clipboard. The nurse goes away. The clipboard goes with her. The nurse and the clipboard are never seen again. They exit the story. A couple of hours later, a male doctor comes out, um, performs a similar function. Um, she's intimidated by the fact that he's a male authority figure in a lab coat, and so she minimizes her symptoms. 
He prescribes a lot of pain relief. She goes back to her village. Two or three days later, she comes back to the hospital. And this is the point where she meets my German medicine sans frontier um, uh, fellow um, um, cheese, toaster cheese eater. And by this stage, things have progressed quite seriously. So where did, where did things break down? Was it the form? No. Was it the nurse? No, the nurse wanted a healthy mother and a healthy baby. Was it the doctor? No, he tried his best and he worked with the information that he had. The issue was with the system. The system had a problem. And systems are so complicated, it's very hard for people inside the system to understand where the intervention points are that are going to allow them to make a real difference, to actually solve these problems. So um, what, is, what is design thinking? Design thinking is about understanding systems. It's about understanding where system intervention points are. And it's also about standing, understanding the users who are using that system, their environment, their cultural dynamics, how they see the world, and building it for them. Um, I have two more quick stories. How long do I have, by the way? While he's working it out, the second yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, so the second story, um, we, we were down in Uganda helping the Grameen Foundation develop a mobile application targeting very poor, poor people in very um, remote communities um, to be able to provide banking services to them. They're using mobile phones that are like the ones you threw away in 2001, but they're across the, um, the country and people are doing amazing things with them. We came in at the tail end of a huge ethnographic study piece where they'd spend two or three months going out to villages, understanding everything about the cultural dynamic, understanding that there are certain people who, uh, when they try to save, um, get asked for a loan and they can't say, to loan someone some money and they can't say no. They started to understand things about the savings in infrastructures that were already in the villages, which could break if this application was designed wrong and rolled out wrong. In short, they started to understand a bunch of things that completely changed the way they were designed this mobile phone banking service, which is all about saving for things like school fees. Which, uh, saving for school fees is the number one thing people want to save for in Uganda. And considering the fact that I was driven from Entebbe to Kampala by a man who was one of 29 siblings, this is actually quite a big cost. So they want to save for school fees, they want to save for cows, they want to save for um, small business startups. Um, you could go in there and design something which would be absolutely right from a requirements basis, but absolutely wrong from a cultural basis. Um, when the Grameen Foundation, and so we work with them to kind of blueprint the, the service and, and, uh, and the app. Um, what was different? What was different was that Grameen went in, they did a huge amount of work understanding the local population. They took that and used that insight to think about the systems, cultural, technological, and then they designed with that awareness strongly in mind. Um, that leads to a successful design, whereas just designing based on what you think a person is like um, leads to an unsuccessful design. So where am I taking all of this? Um, at ThinkPlace, um, we do a lot of innovation work, we do a lot of ethnographic work, we do a lot of um, kind of high-level blueprinting work, and we get asked again and again to do these studies for organisations who are trying to design services that are going to make a huge impact to often very vulnerable populations. Um, we talk about open sourcing data. The thing that I'm kind of interested in is all this insight that gets pulled back from these communities. How could we encourage government to open source that? Um, we get data streams. Um, and, and our relationship is, okay, work out what to do with them. But there's all this data, some of it anecdotal, some of it metric-based, um, that could, if it was put into the hands of developers who are working with them um, to provide effectively partner government services, if they had that, they could design things that would be even more powerful because they would be designed in the full knowledge of the communities that really need help and what life is like for them. So I guess um, that's probably me out of time. Um, but I'm really interested in this notion of design thinking as a system problem, as an understanding um, communities problem, and how all the insight that government is drawing on to, sort, to get across those types of challenges can be open source, just like the data we use through APIs. Thanks. So next up we have James Purser, um, who I've just found out has his uh, own site. So because I know we all love links and we all uh, have short attention spans and we like to read things while people are talking at us, um, 
I'm right here. He has a site. There we go. Yeah. Um, that's actually my personal blog. So, um, okay, I'm completely unprepared for this, but I will tell you a story. I come from a local government background when it comes to government. For two and a half years I worked for the local government and Shires Association as their web guy. Plus I helped out in running the um, annual sort of get together we had for anybody interested in web stuff and sort of open government at a local level. And before that I had a couple of clients that were local government who wanted to reach out and start doing something with this internet thing. Um, but the story I'm telling you is about, uh, there was a, I, there's a couple of guys I know in Google who work in their, Google, their critical response team. Um, these are the guys who put out the maps for typhoons, cyclones and everything else that collate all the data to try and present a coherent map of what's going on in a, in a disaster area. They do some really cool stuff. Um, pretty sure they've got some stuff up now for Brisbane and Victoria regarding the fire and the floods. At the time, I was contacted because I was working at the LGSA and they said, look, we need to find some road information. We need to find road closure information. And we, but we have a problem. We have the RTA on the one hand, which is a state government level body, who own some of the roads. And then we have a whole bunch of councils who own the other roads. But we don't have any way of actually getting the information out from the local government areas and the RTA and marrying it up properly. Do you have a contact? And as, as I did, the LGSA does a lot of policy development for local government in New South Wales, so they have a roads guy, because that's one of the three R's for local government, roads, rubbish, rates. Sometimes it's rubbish, roads need rates. Um, but, so I, I passed him on and he came back and said, well, I can give you some stuff, but the RTA really doesn't like letting go of their information. And the councils, some of them don't have the information that they're looking for. Where I'm going with this is that open government is great, open data is wonderful. But we also need to look at cross-jurisdictional issues. Because as you know, I mean, sorry, hands up again, how many people are in federal? Okay, how many people are in state? How many people in state have experienced somebody from federal saying, you're now responsible for this? Okay. Council gets that again. Local government gets that again. Federal says, okay, we can't deal with this, state can do it. State says, we can't deal with this, but we're going to take the money for it that federal's given us, and we're going to make the councils do it. Which is a whole, you know, a nice little waterfall of crap falling on the councils. I'm not bitter. I really am not bitter about this at all. But council and but you, what you end up with is this cross-jurisdictional issue where some of the data sits in local, some of the data sits in state, and even sometimes we have some of the data sitting in federal, and we've got to marry it up. So there needs to be a whole, when we talk of whole of government solutions, we're not just talking whole of federal government or whole of state government. We need to say, okay, all three levels need to talk to each other and work out how to do this properly. And that's what I was trying to say when I was, you know, brought up local government before. We need to take all three levels of government into consideration when we're talking about service delivery, because if we don't, something's going to break and it just won't be effective or cost effective. I'm not going to go five minutes, so <laughs> that's me. Um, that is my personal site, so if you're interested in my views on Google, Internet, TV and all the rest of it, I occasionally rant. Feel free. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now it's me, I guess. And I'll even time myself, there we go. Um, who here actually came to the conference because, because they saw the word open government in it? And who's here because they're into <coughs> Linux and all things open source? Eh, nice spread. Who's both? Eh, cool, cool, cool. cool. So I'm going to assume that you like building things. Um, who knows this site? Uh, well, that is run using a little uh, DBM package called uh, Fusion Forge, which used to be called GForge. It lets you do source control management, that type of thing. So, of course, you'd all then be familiar with this place. Yes, SourceForge. And, of course, this place, GitHub. 
What we're looking at doing, a few of us, and uh, when I say a few of us, individuals, departments, there's a bit of momentum there, is essentially GovForge for government. We were talking before about, you know, we need to use common standards, we use, need to use uh, common products. Well, the idea that you can simply deploy using something like Fusion Forge to a government platform, lock it down so only government gets into it, um, you can then reshare back using a front end like this or like this, um, to basically start sharing the things we're doing with other agencies. If you've ever worked in uh, federal government, in particular in the IT space, and you've had to do anything with SharePoint, and you've rung up another department and gone, hey, that's awesome, can I have that? And they go, no, get your own .NET developers. We own that. Well, no, the Commonwealth owns it. Um, so I'm not sure how much I can um, sort of talk to, but it does happen. Um, it's already happening. This uh, Gov platform is a joint project between the United States government and the Indian government to make a open government platform built on Drupal um, for data management and releasing open data. Um, they've deployed it on both data.gov.in and the US government, and they share it on GitHub. So you can go and grab it and spin it up and deploy it. Um, they've done the different uh, approach of simply making the entire thing open source and transparent and anyone can participate. But we're talking about um, you know, stuff for government where you may not necessarily want the public to see it, such as IT security patches, uh, a standard Linux image used for government, uh, secure deployments, or we can participate and through one location share back to a wider local government or uh, wider uh, open source community. Um, I look to Pia briefly and say, can I actually show some of the stuff that's been done there already? Okay, yeah. So if you actually like uh, were going to go for it, you can see that the domain exists. We're actually uh, thinking about this. And we've started um, already simply because there's a need uh, setting up small sites where people can come together, they can collaborate. This one is for policy visualisation where you've got uh, policy writers coming together with uh, people who design infographics or do graphing of data or the geo community to go, well, this is the best way to display this type of information when you stick it in the budget or stick it in the cabinet submission or stick it in a policy document. Um, we've had uh, a brief stab at um, another one. Oh, no, that's down. Okay, fair enough. I wasn't sure whether I'd left it up or down or not. Um, where we're doing it for Drupal. Now, this sort of concept would then link into the um, GovShare space. This becomes your, your front-end SourceForge repository browser. Um, but behind it, the one thing we're missing so far is just this collaborative environment where we can check in, we can check out, we can do JavaScript, we can do CSS, we can do websites, we can do enterprise builds, we can do images, we can do whatever, and just start actually sharing with each other. If we've got 200 departments at the federal level, for instance, one developer, one hour a week, coming in, there's 200 hours of development time, and everyone gets the benefit. Um, and that's GovForge in a nutshell, or the concept of um, yeah, collaboratively working together. So it is happening, there is a movement. We'll see a lot more of it. Um, watch this space. And now it's on to discussions and questions and things. <laughs> roving mic, where is the roving mic? You've got the roving mic. And you're our rover? Questions? We've got 25 minutes. Don't be shy. I'm going to go down further than where you were heading and say community groups, which are the grassroots where it all happens. And the former CEO of the city of Salisbury in South Australia used to be 
uh, advisor to the Premier of South Australia and offices like that. And at one stage he got seconded back to there. But then he came back to, the, to Salisbury because he says, in all of this, the Feds make the policies and the States make the policies and do some of the Feds work. But when the work has to get done, it comes down to the local government and the community groups that work with it to actually put the feet on the ground and make the real things happen that all the big heads in Canberra think are really cool. So you've got to think all the way through the levels that if it's got to get to people, then it really comes down to the people that are dealing with those who are in the face of them. So yes, you've got to have all of this open but you still have to reach out to the people because you won't get any changes until it hits the people in the face at the bottom. In, sorry, in, in my view, open government is strictly a people problem. The whole idea of government is a people problem. So if you want to change the culture of government, I mean, we talked, Peter was mentioning that you know, a lot of the high, high level people in the public service might be retiring soon, which is great. But if the culture doesn't change when they retire, then you're still going to have the same issue over and over again. So you've got to teach the people how to be different. So, I mean, whether you do it bottom up through community groups, local government, all the rest of it, or you do it top down, or wedge it somewhere in the middle and hope it sort of spreads out a bit, you know, you're still going to get the people before you can get the frameworks and everything else, before they'll work. Can I add one, one thing to that as well? I think. Um, there is a huge opportunity here for developers who understand the power and the value of data and open source to partner with community groups who understand the communities they're working with to come together and put uh, not just incredible solutions out that are going to make a real difference, but also a really compelling case to government to say this is the specific information that we need and we can work together to create something pretty amazing. So um, I think uh, if there are lots of developers in here, maybe you should uh, go and have a chat to your local community group and see what you, what you guys can do together. Yeah, right plus one million, Matt. One of the issues that I have with, um, you know, you see the hack fests that they do, which are really cool. People put out some really, really cool stuff. The problem with some of them has been that they've been all developers and no government. So, you know, you've had governments release some data sets, they gather a whole bunch of devs in the room, they supply the pizza, the caffeine and all the rest of it. They bring out all these amazing apps and everything dies. Because what the devs have done is said, oh cool, we can do this, we can do that, we can do the other. But the government people haven't said, well, hold on, but we actually need this. Or the community groups haven't been there to say, but we want this. So while the apps are cool, they're innovative, they're wonderful, nobody's using them. So you need to have all of those groups involved with each other, not just the devs and not just the public service. Yeah, the, that goes to um, some of the experience with Victorian pu public data. One of the first line items in the, in the list of data sets is all licensed premises. So you had 18 pub crawling apps. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a bad thing. <laughs> Um, so it's been a number of years since Ajima put out their report into um, open source procurement and how open source should be considered. Um, I'm still sitting in a public service office and I can't get free software installed on computers. How do we fix it? Let's wait for the Ajima person. Well, if you're sitting... Um, let's ask the Ajima person. That, that well, exactly. actually, let's, let's be realistic. If you're sitting in an office and you want open source software installed, yeah. that comes down to you sewing. Now, your standard operating environment is set every time they do a SOE refresh, and most departments are probably coming up to their SOE refresh stage at the moment, is the time to actually agitate with the IT areas and go, we want this in. Uh, it's silly, for instance, to think that... I'm coming from the IT area. Yeah, developers the out there <laughs> who don't have access to every browser for cross-browser testing, for instance, <laughs> um, because it's not part of the SOE. But um, in most departments, if you have a business need and you can articulate that and the cost is, is zero and someone approves it, they'll be sold for you. It, it comes down to pro to procurement, basically. Um, and it used to be the common trick where they'd say, okay, we're gonna write the procurement for this system, must interact with Microsoft Word. 
So all of a sudden, until Libra Office or Star Office came along, Word was all you could buy. You could only buy a Microsoft product because what they did was, the trick was they used to specify the format which was only Microsoft owned. So if you're going to agitate for open source in your environment, you've got to say, okay, how, how is that human environment actually restricting our ability to pick up those pieces of software? And in that sense, what you're talking about is the idea that there isn't a standard operating environment that every single person sitting at their PC should be able to install whatever they want, and that's not going to work in an enterprise. I'm not talking about PCs. I don't care about PCs. Or Macs, or... I care about servers in the data centre and having yeah. access to tools to do work on those servers that may or may not be free source and getting a strategy in so that we can actually provision that in a reliable, repeatable way. But I'm getting, you can't install anything that doesn't come from a vendor. Yeah, so again, it comes down to the procurement, procurement environment and the culture of yeah. the people who are setting up the rules. So if you want to change that culture, you've got to get in there and change it. So, I mean, if, the, if it's vendor based and you want open source, there are enough open source vendors out there who will take their money, who will happily, quite happily take their money. The problem often comes down to this hard thing. Oh, can we wait for my I think the problem, again, is incentive. People don't want to do this. Uh, they are going to get their next job because they've worked on an Oracle system. I've, uh, they're going to get their next job because they're Microsoft and they've worked on a big, uh, expensive Microsoft uh, system. So, like, you're never going to be able to change management unless there's some sort of incentive to change. And ultimately, the people who are choosing the technology aren't technical. They're they hire expensive consultants that tell them what to do, and the consultants, and often the consultants are told, "This is the solution you're going to come up with. Produce me a document that will, you know, the, the procurement process will end up at this end stage." Um, so I think a lot of it is how do we change the incentive structure to promote at least not necessarily open source, but just a like a data-based decisions. Um, if, keep in mind that if you're working for the government and you think yourself a professional sort of person, you can, in your professional capacity outside government, help write policy, help lobby government on what to do. Uh, I found that when I was in government, the best thing to do was have something put in the newspaper. <laughs> and then, and then, or a, a question to the minister, and then someone would rush in and say, oh, we've got to answer this question. So um, there's that sort of thing as well. You can do it openly and you know, that sort of thing. Um, but you need to just empower yourself and you can say, well, in my association, be it the open software, whatever, uh, we believe this and we're gonna lobby the government, the minister, the department, that we think this should be done. And then in your internal capacity, respond to it. And uh, that works fairly well. Government doesn't really know necessarily what to do and, and welcomes outside ideas a lot of the time, as long as it fits with the political <laughs> agenda for things. I was going to say. Um... Um, so it, it is handy, for instance, to find a way where it'll make the minister look good or the departmental secretary or whoever. But don't think you just, you know, have to do what you're told at work. Uh, so, um, a very quick comment on, on that whole thing. There are um, some really good policies and stuff from Finance and Ajima that cover off most of that. You need to be aware of them. But at the moment, the best way to convince people to do something in the, at least the federal and state governments, and I'm sure local government, is this will save you money. And it's, you also need to add a magic buzzword. I suggest cloud is that buzzword. If you want to spin up a server, it'll cost you next to nothing and it's a monthly thing in a cloud and there are secure cloud providers in Canberra and in Sydney so that the, the government security stuff is, isn't an issue for most things. Um, if you go to desktop, uh, there's a policy there that says that here's a specification for a SOE. So far, no one's built a Linux SOE, but the spec's there. 
We've just got to do it. In fact, just while we're waiting for the next question, we need to be careful when we're talking about the GMO has put into place that there's something about open source. What it is is when you go to a service provider for a product, so you can't say, I'm going out to market for Microsoft, where's my open source option? Because no, the tender is for Microsoft. If you go out to market for a um, word processing system and you go to one of the expensive consultants, the rule is that they must give you an open source option. And then when you look at the options, you do a cost benefit analysis to say that yes, this thing is cheaper on paper than this thing, but I'm going to have to employ 50 people to support that rather than one person. Or because you know the open source community drives a lot of this stuff, which makes it a lot more secure because patches come out more regularly. You look at the total total cost of ownership, and then you make an informed decision. But the rule is there to make sure that open source isn't left out in the cold. Yeah, and go and see if there is. There's already a policy or procedure on it. Where there isn't, go and look at the what, what's the US government one, what's the UK government one, and uh, suggest doing that. Okay, we're questions. So, so back on the SOE talk, um, there's a there's a move out there in the in the commercial world, in in most of the business world for uh, BYOD. And is that is that being bring your own device? So there's people bringing in iPads and Android tablets and all sorts of laptops and things to work. Uh, Suncorp, for example, uh, I think have that policy in place now, and it's the job of the network people and everyone else to control. Um, the other side of that. Is, is that even vaguely being talked about in government at all? Or? Um, yes, uh, government departments are considering BOOD as an option now. Um, right. It happens by default anywhere you get uh, remote access services. For instance, uh, with yep. my department, I, I can remote in on my Android tablet, um, on an iPhone, on my normal phone, on any operating system I want, as long as I've got the Citrix plugin. And so if I, if I worked for a department and showed up with an Ubuntu laptop, there's a chance I'd be able to... It would depend on their internal policy, whether they want you to bring your own device or not, and whether they allow you access to the network um, on a device that's not departmental. But yep. yeah, the, the policies are, are there and people are actually taking a fairly common sense approach to it where if it's cheaper, if it gets the work done, and then the, um, people will do it. And there are defence security different. Um, DSD guidelines in the security part. The, um, I've heard a number of times the, uh, some, some comments made about Agimo's position towards open source software and some of the, the phrasing from the panel seems to be very positive. Unfortunately, the Agimo model clauses, the most operative word that you put in an RFT statement of requirements is consider, which means that the Commonwealth will consider an open source proposition. Further, the Commonwealth's policy position, Pia, can you confirm the Commonwealth's policy position is that of um, informed neutrality? That's still the current buzzword within Agimo. So what I'm trying to get a balance between are the words on the site which I've been trying to get my tablet up to find that have been struggling for the last couple of minutes because my brain's not working. Um, so I think the actual wording that agencies are required to use when going to market are a lot weaker than some of the statements that you guys are, are putting forward. Have a look at the actual open source page on the um, Agimo website. Um, when you've got a moment, have a look at the procurement document. There are procurement requirements in terms of uh, Agimo's position directly. I mean, I'm, I will not. Um, so I'm not going to represent Ajimo right now because the dude who can do that can do that in the next panel. So you can ask him directly. But basically, Ajimo, you know, is not really in a position to say you must buy this or must buy that, uh, except for a very, very small number of things. Um, and this is not one of them. What they have done is um, put in place a requirement for procurement, um, a requirement that all um, procurement tenders have to have something in there which says, how have you considered open source? It's not, it's not actually that bad. Um, where, where are you talking about, but when you say considered, there's a difference between um, the sort of recommendation about what people should use versus what has to go into a procurement guide, uh, a procurement document. So um, have a look at it and let's chat about it afterwards. And that said, the, the word considered is prescriptive in that because we must show in government um, fair and open, um, transparent practices around procurement, we have to be able to show on paper that we have indeed considered something. And it's not just a job going to an incumbent vendor under the table 
whatever when actually considered it. Can, can I throw in one, one extra view on this? Um, I think a lot of the time um, we talk about um, this can save costs and we're right. That's absolutely true. But there's other things, there's other arguments for open source software and some of them are about community outcome. I think when you say this is a rule, your disincentive is you're going to get slapped on the head if you don't do it. Um, this is your incentive, you're going to save money. Um, you know, there, there is, there's some power in those carrots and sticks. But I think if we made the case to say, well, actually, if you go with this case management system, for example, we can do a whole bunch of things that are really going to change people's lives that you just can't do with a lot of the standard offerings. And oh, by the way, if we put some, um, something into the community, maybe we can get them to come to the party and create the, the, uh, the customizations we need to, um, um, to, to make a real difference. So I just, it just intrigues me. Do we ever make an argument for open source that is about community outcome and functionality and flexibility rather than technology and finances? And if not, why on earth not? That's right, but the project sponsors often can, and I think that's a really exciting headspace to get them in. Okay, next question. Firstly, just a quick comment. Something I've found always very useful in getting IT professionals in government to consider uh, different software outside their SOE is to point out to them that they run a footy tipping piece of software on their network that has never been procured, that was never uh, actually uh, properly accounted for um, in their processes. And uh, if they're prepared to do it for footy tipping, then surely they'll do it for business practice. Also a very good question at Senate Estimates uh, at some point about footy tipping software use in government agencies. Yeah, but footy tipping's serious. I mean, that's, you've got to make sure that's done right. <laughs> Very true. Um, one of the things that I've definitely seen government agencies and still see is the propensity for them when they're trying to get in a piece of software or a technology that they need, sometimes you know, cloud hosted, sometimes within their own network, um, and they come up against uh, some of these uh, issues, um, is what they do is they go to an expensive uh, vendor or a third party like an advertising agency and say, can you run this on our behalf and charge us whatever you want for it and we'll just pay for it. Um, so there is that inherent cost in that. Um, what sort of work is being done to actually identify where that's occurring and actually try and you know, show agencies that it is far more effective and cheaper for them to take some of these things in-house? I could tell you a story about Andrew Tridgell and the Defence Department. That sounds awesome. Um, on this subject, he got this phone call to the Defence Department. Andrew's saying, oh, I'm building some software called Samba. Could the Defence Department give us some money to do it so we can give it away? I said, no, our procedures don't allow that. Can you send me an empty cardboard box with Samba written on it and an invoice? And we can pay you then. <laughs> right. And he said, but we haven't got it to work yet. And I said, well, most of our software doesn't work with it. <laughs> But unfortunately, he just was too ethically bound not to do that. So we couldn't give him any money at that stage. Um, hi, this is picking up on something that um, <laughs> the red shirt on the panel said um, a bit earlier today. <laughs> sorry, I didn't catch it. <laughs> so, sorry, James. I, <laughs> it doesn't look good for you. Um, you were talking about government being people and government culture being people and the way to change that is to change the people essentially. Um, I know that I haven't really looked at a lot of government stuff until moving to Canberra and then I see people like Pierre, you know, people that I know moving into government and kicking ass and, and trying to change from within. Um, how do we make government jobs and working in a, a rigid government structure as it is now something that's attractive or sexy to the hackers and the geeks who, if you know, can you imagine if we all in this room got into a department in positions, what, how we could transform radically the culture and the policy and the outcomes? How do we ma how do we make that sexy for um, I don't know, the hackers? It is sexy. We do. <laughs> or, or is that the or is that the answer? Just just get the message out there that it is awesome and it is sexy. Come join us. From the outside, the typical public servant is not seen as your hacker type. You know, radically staying up. You know, sculling coffee. Oh. Yeah. Um, I think adding the 
ability to risk something is probably one of the biggest factors you can add. Um, I, to, me, to be honest, I haven't actually had public service experience myself. I've worked peripherally in terms of as a consultant to local government and as the web guy at the LGSA. But I've seen the culture from the outside. And one of the cultural things that I've seen, and again, my experience is strictly local government, but I'm pretty sure this can be reflected half the stack, is risk is something that, they run, that you are meant to run away from. If you are writing a policy, you make sure you get everybody signed off, you make sure everybody's as happy as possible before it goes anywhere near an executive to sign off and implement. Um, if you're writing a product or you're putting together a service, you make sure that everybody's happy with it, you do not go outside of the boundaries and all the rest of it. If you want to attract people like Pia or like Panare, who are doing a Okay, hands up who's heard of Open Australia? Okay, can I stand up? Yeah. Give this man a round of applause. Panaro is exactly the sort of hacker you want to attract into the public service because with, through his work and Matthew Landau's and everybody else who's connected with Open Australia, they created some really cool services that the government would have, now excuse my French, would have shit themselves to actually make and make available in the way that they've done it. If you have a look at planning alerts, not leaving aside open, the Open Australia website, which is a way to get into Hansard and know your member, um, Planning Alerts is an incredibly disruptive service because it allows you to keep track of development applications in your area without actually having to go into the council. Now, I, I mean, they built a website which emails you every time that somebody puts up a development application in your area. So if, so if your next door neighbour wants to build that third story under their McMansion, you'll find out about it before the guys turn up with the cranes and everything else. So, go look at planningalerts.net.au. Look at planningalerts.org.au. Um, but it's that sort of risk taking because what they did to start off with was that they scraped all these council websites for their data. They didn't. Re um, that's right, you, you scraped before you asked permission, wasn't it? Yes. So basically, they just went out and saw that all these councils, because of um, regulation, they had to have their information up on the website, DGAs, but is anybody seen a council website? Uh, yeah, is it easy to use? <coughs> no. They've done the hard yards, built the scrapers to go out and get this information and present it in an easy to use and readable format. But the councils couldn't do that themselves because it was a risk. It was a risk because they were putting information out there. There is a current risk, there is a current problem in New South Wales where they have the Gipper Act, which is a which is a state government wide um, act which requires information to be put out. Did you know there is copyright on development applications? Did you know that by putting up the development applications, they, the councils are actually breaching that copyright? An architect or a person could actually sue the council for breach of copyright and have, in fact, sued them for breach of copyright for putting that information out there. And they won, as far as I know. But legally they are required to put that information out there, so legally the state government's requiring the councils to say, sue me! I can take it! I like it! Just to as the, I guess, the wife of the dog in the room, being the only government guy on the panel. Um, that, that sort of I wouldn't call you a dog. Well, um, I'm not sure you can, in that sense, uh, change things to attract people in a certain way. It's kind of like designers. You're either a designer or you're not. You may love it, but you're either a designer or you're not. We're always going to attract, regardless of industry, people to the public service who want to work in the service of the public. Some of those geeks will want to go and work at Google, will want to go and work at Amazon, will want to go and do cool open source stuff that earns them no money and go into academia. Others will always want to work in the service of the public. So we do attract the Henares, the Peers, the, the Jameses, the people who are involved, because it is a small community. You don't see it changing a lot, because they're people who just want to do that. So it, it's, it's, it's a bit of a, a carrot and the, and the donkey and the horse and the cart. 
Um, do we change the public service and say, hey, we, we build cool things, come and join us? Um, we're going to attract those people anyway. So maybe it's more just a let's actually focus on the who's going to do the cool things and what cool things we're going to make because we will get the best and brightest coming into the public service because they want to. Yeah, but I mean, I've heard this. Um, I've heard this from a number of former public servants where they have the passion for public service, they want to get in there, they want to change stuff, they want to serve the public. But then they hit that wall of public service culture which yes. says, this is your role, Correct. this is all you're going to do for the next 20 years, suck it up. And I'm not discounting that. Hanea, mm. like working in the service of the public, but he's not a public servant. Because of that reason, though, you can a, you can do it. You you will always so, okay, go no, into no, that. Just on that space. Um, there's an example somewhere that. Has, sorry, we have the microphone. Sorry. We lost it. Um, as an example of somewhere that actually has done it over in the UK, um, like what um, James was saying, because um, intelligent hackers and, and smart people get involved in public service, then they hit these barriers, um, they then leave the public service and go, all right, I'm going to go into a startup or I'll work at Google or something. Over in the UK, um, they have the, I can't remember, there's a, there's a digital office over there. Government digital service. Yes, that's it, GDS, yeah, Government Digital Services. And so they basically said, right, you can redesign government. And so they got all these really smart designers and things in um, to, you know, make citizen-centric services, and then they started to attract all of those really smart hackers. And so I think that, uh, well, I think, well, from my perspective as a hacker, yes, you have to, ch to the government has to change um, to attract um, hackers. And uh, you can also do it in a way that you get some really smart people on board. So I think you, it can be done in the right way. I think there's one, one cultural thing, and it's kind of interesting because I think about uh, Finland who have um, released this app where people can raise issues that they want discussed in Parliament and if you get 50,000 likes, it has to be discussed. No ifs, no buts, no maybes, it has to get discussed. Has anybody asked them for a Death Star yet? Uh, no, but they have asked them to ban energy drinks and stop the uh, seal uh, for industry. So uh, I, I like the last one, but I hate the first one. But <laughs> I, like, I like the energy drinks, but I want to save the seals. Um, so I think just uh, just up the reason why I'm so interesting is that if government gets one thing, if a government takes an innovation step and something goes wrong, one privacy breach, one um, person out of pocket, anything at all. The media will jump on that, the public will jump on the media, and suddenly government is in a lot of reputational damage control, government is in a lot of potential litigation damage control. I think there's something as well about how we as the public react to experimentation in government that kind of quells government and puts them into that risk averse position, and uh, I don't know how you fix that, it's just an observation that I'd make. I think part of the problem is the fact that the public service is risk averse, as you say, as opposed to risk management. I mean, if you manage the risk, you can, okay, you can see, if you plan it properly, you can see, okay, this might be where the privacy leaks happen, this might be where something happened. If you manage those risks so that they're as small as possible, as opposed to saying, holy crap, we might actually do something that might break something, and we can't, we can't go within 10 feet of that. Yeah, and, That's what, and a great way to manage that type of risk is to create a very small limited space for experimentation mm. and things can slowly well, like prove this themselves. digital services office in yeah. um, the UK. Well, that's what I wanted to mention. Um, in some of the agencies I've worked in, and I don't know how widespread this is, there's often a, a shadow IT infrastructure of, <laughs> of enthusiasts and, and, and people with passion who will bend the rules uh, as much as possible. And that's where the innovation happens. And, and once you get something that's actually working really well, you can seek forgiveness for your transgressions. Yeah. And <laughs> ask forgiveness before asking permission. Yeah, and, and often sort of a well, you know, a well-placed donut can get any sort of open source software on your desktop uh, that you could desire. Oh, he's gone. The guy who was asking about getting open source. So, are there any other? We got one more question. We're going to have to wrap it up, I think. Yeah, I was just going to add about the digital service. They did exactly the same thing as planning alerts. They scraped the sites of all the government departments and then made the thing, made a public launch. The departments didn't even realise that it had happened and then they all took credit for it. Oh yes, we loved the government digital service. We were so helpful. Oh, just, just one other thing. 
How many councils have you got actively working with you now on planning alerts? Uh, maybe half a dozen or so. Yeah, these are councils that are actually using planning alerts to do their own, to present their DAs. I mean, Pitwater Council is doing it. Yeah. Yeah, and there's a couple of others who are actually engaging to use that information to present it in a useful way. So How much more useful would it, yeah, easier would it have been if there was an API and there was a standard? Planning Alerts has an API, I've built an app off it. Right, yeah, but it's been screen scraped. Yeah, and yeah. we've got about two councils that have provided, or three councils that have provided that out, the, yeah, out, out of 500 in Australia. Yeah, so one standard of the uh, that they Oh, yeah, we've had that discussion about um, standardised, yeah. <laughs> tears, tears were shed. Lunch. 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 Cool. Lunch. Yeah, we just wrap up. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Thank you for the time.